do things look like from the cockpit of a 747? Mark Van Honecker will join us to talk about his new book, Skyfaring, A Journey with a Pilot. The book is, in a sense, what I would show you uh, during flight. It's what I would tell you about if, if you could come up while we were over Siberia or, or over Greenland. What happened when a Virginia school district shut down its schools to prevent desegregation? Kristen Green will be here to talk about her new book, Something Must Be Done About Prince Edward County. There are kids who travel across the county lines every day to go to another school or live with grandparents during the week. And there are kids who went to work in the fields with their parents, you know, often picking tobacco and and never returned to school. Alexander Alter will let us know what's going on in the publishing world. Greg Coles has bestseller news. And we'll let readers and listeners ask a few questions for us editors here at the Book Review. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Mark Van Honecker joins us now. He is the author of Skyfaring, A Journey with a Pilot. Hi, Mark. Hi, I'm happy to be here. A Journey with a Pilot. You're the pilot, presumably, in the in the subtitle. Um, but it's interesting that you did it in that third person. I kind of wanted to – I didn't necessarily want to be so much about me initially. I wanted to really write about – Uh, the experience of flying in a very general sense and and to compare what you see from the flight deck with what you can see as a passenger. Uh, And then as I went along, I was encouraged to put more and more of uh, of my personal uh, story into it, into how I got into flying. Uh, And so I added those details in. And so the, the title perhaps reflects those two tensions. You do have an interesting path to becoming a pilot. This is not the first thing that you did out of school. How did you become a pilot? Well, I grew up in a, in a pretty small town in western Massachusetts, and uh, I was obsessed with airplanes. I, I had you know model airplanes hanging from my ceiling. I was always asking my parents to take me to air shows. Um, but we didn't know any pilots, and there wasn't a big airport nearby. Uh, and I think if I'd had an uncle or an aunt who was a pilot, I, I might it might have occurred to me more naturally to get into it. Aside from that, it just seemed it seemed like a dream to me. It seemed like becoming an astronaut. Uh, and so I followed on other paths. I, I studied history in college. Uh, I started a PhD in history. Um, I did about a third of it. I, I did the P, I guess. And then, what happened to that? <laughs> uh, I was studying African history, um, mm-hmm. and I went to Kenya in the second year. It was in, done in the UK, so where a PhD is about three years as opposed to the US. So in the second year, I sent myself to, to Nairobi to do some research, and I, I landed there, and I and I, I suddenly realized that for me, the most exciting part of the trip had already happened. It was, you know, it was the flight to get there. And so then I thought, well, you know, I'd always wanted to be a pilot. Maybe I should figure out how to how to make it happen. So I I made that uh, very difficult decision to leave the degree. Uh, and then on the way back to London, uh, I asked if I could go up into the flight deck. Uh, and this was a flight from, we connected in, I think, in Abu Dhabi. And so they let me come up into the flight deck. And I ended up chatting with the pilots there. And the, the co-pilot was in his late 20s, like I was then. We were right over Istanbul. Uh, we were looking down at, you know, Asia and Europe, and the, the sun shining on the city. Both pilots said, "Oh, you should do it. It's the best job in the world." And uh, so then I decided I'd give it a go. Uh, and then I needed to save some money for my flight training, uh, but I also wanted to fly a lot as a passenger and, and travel. And so the intersection of of those demands and my my talents uh, was uh, was management consulting. So so I went into management consulting in Boston for a couple of years. Traveled a, a whole lot as a passenger, uh, often with the airline uh, British Airways that I work for now. I mm-hmm. uh, went up to the flight deck a whole bunch of times and, and met pilots that I now fly with um, on planes I now fly. Uh, meanwhile, I was applying for these training programs that European airlines have where they take you from no flight hours all the way up to a, an airline uh, license. How does that differ from the U.S. Um, way of doing it? Well, my understanding uh, in the U.S. is that you start your training and then eventually you start adding ratings and then eventually you become an instructor. And then uh, you start flying a very small plane, and, and you slowly work your way up. So you teach before you do. Yeah, that was the traditional path in the U.S., aside from the military, of course. Uh, whereas in uh, in Europe, and in fact, most places outside the U.S., the more common path is to is for airlines uh, to take people at a young age and put them through a very uh, uh, rigorous two-year program, which involves a lot of classroom instruction plus, of course, actual flying. And, and then you're sort of tied to that airline for uh, for life if you're if you're lucky. So you sort of pick your employer before you even go to school, that's or right. your employer picks you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's uh, everything in the airline industry is driven by seniority. So uh, the question of when I go to work, what days I work, and where I go when I work, whether I work on Christmas or New Year's Eve, is is based on when you join the company. So there's a big incentive to stay with your employer. Um, so I applied for the, the British Airways program and was accepted in uh, 2001. Was that your first choice, British, it was. British Airways? Why British Airways? 
Well, when I was a kid, I was just I was obsessed with these really iconic airlines like uh, like Pan, Pan Am and British Airways were my, you know, that yeah. One of those was <laughs> yeah. no longer an option. Exactly, exactly. And at the, when I applied, uh, British Airways had Concorde. Uh, it had uh, 747s, uh, the largest fleet in the world uh, at the time. The whole world uh, was its network, and it's, you know, it still is. So you really you have a, a choice of airplanes to fly and places to go that's pretty much unparalleled in the world. So it's a, it's a great place to be. Did you want to fly the Concorde? When I went for my interviews, I was certainly uh, I was certainly keen to fly it. Uh, but it's it's actually the 747 that I was obsessed with as a kid, and that I'm I'm still I'm still a big kid when it comes to when I when I walk onto one. What's the allure of the 747? It's just so iconic. It's that the shape and it's the numbers. Uh, you know, Joni Mitchell sings about uh, seeing 747s over geometric farms. You know, she doesn't have to say it's an airplane. She doesn't have to say it's a Boeing. You know, it's just those those three digits which symbolize a whole. Worldview. Uh, it was that that was the plane that opened up the possibility of global travel to the global middle class, and it's and also it just looks great. It's just uh, if somebody described what it looked like, if they said we're going to have this great big plane and we're going to have a big like bump in the front of it, you wouldn't think it would look good, but it looks amazing. And, and I often think that's because it looks like a bird. I mean, the the the, the nose looks like the head of of, 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 of just an amazing bird. And uh, the lead designer of the 747, the guy, this guy named Joseph Sutter. Uh, who wrote a great book about his about his work on it? Uh, was obsessed with birds as a kid, and, and I like to think that uh, the the birds he watched as a boy are are something that we see when we see a seven forty seven taking off. A lot of what you write in the book is about the beauty and joy of air travel, and um, for many passengers today, unless you're in business class or business class plus or first class, um, flying today is often seen as a terrible hassle and discomfort. And I'm curious if if you thought about that when writing this book that this is a sort of counter narrative or to remember the good aspects. Well, the the book has has really two directions. I mean, one, I wanted to share with with family and friends and and some passengers what we see from the flight deck that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access unless unless you're a pilot. But I also wanted, you know, my friends always laugh when I check in for a flight as a passenger because I always ask for a window seat, <laughs> and you know, they always say, "Well, why why do you want a window seat now? You've got the best window seats in the world when you're at work." Um, but I love to fly as a passenger, and I love to be in the window seat. I think it's um, to have those kind of hours above the world, you know, in just the same way that we would sit in a coffee shop and watch the world go by. In the window seat of an airliner, that's we literally watch the world go by. And I'm often saving books or articles or uh, podcasts for when I'm flying as a passenger. Um, I think it's a very lovely meditative space. Uh, I love listening to music. Uh, the first flight I really remember well is the one is the first one I had a Walkman on, <laughs> uh, where I could listen to the music I wanted to. And so the idea of you know, putting music on and watching watching the planet turn beneath you, watch you know mountains turn to deserts, to the ocean, is uh, to watch northern lights, to watch uh, you know cities go by on, on on a cold winter night, and you watch you're flying over Minneapolis or something, and you see this whole city glowing on the snow, and and you're listening to the, to music or reading. I think it's a lovely modern space, and I know a lot of people want to work on the plane because they have to work or they want to get online, uh, you know. But for me. I love that airplane mode on your phone when you're flying as a passenger. It's, it's a gift, really, and one that's that's more valuable. There is this narrative that the magic of flying has been sort of deflating since the 1920s or the 1960s, but but I think there's been some recent innovations which which really do make it uh, a better experience. I mean, for a long time, you could walk through some airports and and get on a plane without actually seeing the plane. I mean, the, the airports were so dankly built and, and and so windowless you know the uh, the airport I'm based at Heathrow uh, Terminal 5 it's a box of glass I mean it was built to connect passengers with the air show that's going on all, all around them some new airplanes have come out recently like the um, the 787 the Boeing Dreamliner uh, which has these huge windows which are much bigger than the windows on a normal airplane have you flown that plane I've flown on it as passenger and it's it's amazing it's uh, the windows are I don't know quite how much larger they are but if you've ever driven past like a like a slatted wooden fence and you go a certain speed and suddenly you can see through the fence because you're passing it at that rate, I had exactly the same experience on takeoff. It was like the wall of the plane almost disappeared. And, you know, Boeing didn't have to do that. They did it because they want to reinvigorate the experience. How long have you been a pilot? Um, so I started my training 14 years ago, and I've been an airline pilot for 12 years. And has your experience changed as a pilot in those 12 years? You obviously started post 9-11, which is, I would imagine, a big kind of break in pilot experience. Uh, that's right. When I became a pilot, it was uh, already after 9-11. And 
of course, we can no longer have visitors in the cockpit during flight. But we do often have visitors come up before the flight and, and after we parked at the gate. The interactions that I've had with, with, with passengers that way, children, but not, not just children, that, that was one of the reasons I wanted to write the book. Uh, the book is, in a sense, what I would show you uh, during flight. It's what I would tell you about if, if you could come up while we were over Siberia or, or over Greenland. And, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, you know, some future generations of pilots will – We'll, we'll read it and, uh, and maybe be inspired uh, to take up what, what I think is the best job in the world. Um, I just want to go back to one thing you mentioned earlier, which was the northern lights. Uh, what's that like from the cockpit? They're just amazing. Uh, it's, they appear on certain routes uh, in certain seasons. Uh, I guess the most regular route I fly where I see them is from Vancouver uh, to London, which is quite a far northerly route. And in the winter, uh, that flight is uh, is in darkness for a lot of the time, and that's when it's you're most likely to see the northern lights. Sometimes they're there for hours and hours on end, um, and just one side of the sky is this is this glowing curtain of light, and it's very peculiar to watch them because they they move but very slowly. It's 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 one of the, it's almost like watching um, like a like clouds uh, forming where you can just about on a very hot day you can almost see them actually changing shape but not quite but this is just pure light and of course behind them are the stars and shooting stars sometimes that was also one of the reasons i wanted to write the book i mean when you see northern lights for hours every other week or when you see so many shooting stars you forget to to wish on them you can kind of get accustomed to to that kind of wonder and and it becomes ordinary Uh, and so writing the book uh, was a way for me to remind myself what i like about the job and and maybe to discuss more generally what's amazing about about flying, because of course many people fly so often now that it's uh, it's easy to to think of it in a very casual um, and, and ordinary way. Is there any phenomenon that you see from the cockpit that's a rarity that you look for that you look forward to, whether it's a harvest moon or the northern lights or a shooting star? Uh, we don't fly to Tokyo anymore on the uh, 747, but in the years we did, if you went in the summer, sometimes the you take this quite far north route and you end up going into the area of the northern latitudes where the sun doesn't go down at all. You take off from London, you head east, and the sun is behind you. And then it moves all the way around the sky. So it's suddenly off to your left. It's The sun is due north. And then it comes all the way around. And then suddenly it's where it will be for your morning in Tokyo. You see the sun making this circle around the sky. And, and you really start to understand that night is less of a time than a, than a space. And, and day is as well. And there's this great uh, quote uh, from Gilead by, by uh, Marilyn Robinson, which I use in the book, where she uh, she talks about there only being one day. There's, there's only ever been one day, and the Earth just turns around in it. Um, and that's exactly the sense you have uh, on those polar routes in summer. Well, I think that will inspire all of us to look out of the window a bit more often. Mark, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The book, again, is Skyfaring, A Journey with a Pilot by Mark Van Honecker. Alexandra Alter is here to let us know what's going on in the literary world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. What's new? So I have some suggested listening as opposed to reading for some of our listeners this holiday weekend. Stephen King has released a new audiobook exclusive, and it's sort of tied to the holiday weekend. It's called Drunken Fireworks. It is a story about a man in Maine who gets um, involved in sort of this amateur fireworks competition that spins out of control. And it sort of captures a lot of things about Maine that Stephen King has often highlighted in his work. But the thing that caught my eye, you know, covering the publishing industry is that you don't often see standalone audiobooks coming out. It's something that's starting to pick up now as the whole audiobook industry is kicking into overdrive and podcasts are becoming more popular. But this is something that writers have started to experiment with. They're thinking of listeners as much as readers. And so you're seeing writers like the thriller writer Jeffrey Deaver or the science fiction writer John Scalzi releasing standalone audio works. Audiobooks has really become a huge hot category in it publishing. It is. I mean, if you look at the growth, it looks the way ebooks looked. You know, 10 years ago, it's almost 30% growth in both unit sales and revenues. And the production is up massively, too. Is this because everybody is walking around with earbuds in their, you know, on this their heads exactly. all the time? And so I think it's, you know, there's really two things driving the trend. One is smartphones. Obviously, everyone has an audio book player in their pocket now. And that wasn't the case. The books are easy to download. 
download and listen to. And the other thing is multitasking. You know, it's like people are strapped for time and they're on a run or they're cooking or they're cleaning. And a lot of people, according to these surveys that have been done by the Audio Publishers Association, actually listen to audiobooks while they're doing something else. So I think that's where you get into the conversations about are audiobooks as good as printed books? Are people paying attention? Or are they getting distracted? But as far as Stephen King is concerned, he said that audiobooks are potentially even better. You can't skim. You can't skip forward. It's this very immersive experience. You're trapped. You're trapped. And the performer can bring out a lot of the nuance for you. And does um, he read the book himself? So he actually got a friend of his who is um, a comedian and author in Maine, Tim Sample. He's a f- famous Maine resident because he wanted somebody who could really capture the nuances of the Maine accent, which is a very specific regional dialect kind of Stephen King said, you know, the thing that drives him crazy is when he hears people mangling it and falling into a southern drawl. So he specifically handpicked his own narrator for this. And I think we might even have a clip that we could listen to so you can sort of hear how he really gets at that New England accent. I gave her one and lit it with my bick. The fuse sparked and she threw it high in the air. It went with a flash bright enough to hurt our eyes and the bang echoed all the way down the lake. I let the other one and flung it like Roger Clemens. Bang! There, Ma says. Now they know who's boss. But then Paul Massimo and his two oldest sons walked down to the end of their dock, and one of them, big, handsome young fella in a rugby shirt, had that goddamn trumpet in a kind of holster thing on his belt. They waved to us. Then the old man handed each of the boys something. They held the somethings out so he could light the fuses. They flang them out over the lake and, holy God, not bang, but boom. Two booms, loud as dynamite, and big white flashes. Those ain't cherry bombs, I said. Them are M-80s. That's a clip from Drunken Fireworks, and it's not a horror story, is it? This is actually not a horror story, and it's kind of funny. It's kind of sweet. It's a little bit tragic. It's a lot about this um, sort of bumbling, unemployed man who spends most of his days drinking coffee brandy with his mother, and they sort of become obsessed with their neighbor's fireworks display, and they go to great and illegal lengths to outdo it. And I guess this is something that Mr. King had kind of noticed happening around Maine on the 4th of July. He watched a lot of YouTube videos of kind of drunk idiots setting off fireworks and starting fires and things like that. All right. So if you want to multitask this weekend and watch fireworks while drinking and listening to an audiobook, this is for you. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks, Pamela. Kristen Green joins us now from Richmond, Virginia. She is the author of Something Must Be Done About Prince Edward County, A Family, A Virginia Town, A Civil Rights Battle. Kristen, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Pamela. Where is Prince Edward County? It's in southern Virginia, about an hour and 15 minutes south of Richmond. So you grew up in Prince Edward County, and you went to school there at a school called Prince Edward Academy, um, a private school. What did you know about the school when you attended as a child? I knew attending Prince Edward Academy that it was um, a school just for white kids, but I don't know that I knew the the full story of why it started. Um, My parents had also attended this school, which was founded in 1959 by white leaders in Prince Edward County when um, community leaders chose to close the public schools for five years rather than desegregate. This was five years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And so what years did you go there? Um, So I started in 78 and graduated in 1991. Um, And while I was there, the school admitted its first black students in 1986 um, in order to get their 501c3 status back. So it wasn't until 1986 that the school officially changed its policy and allowed non-white students to attend. That's right. Let's talk about how this school got started, because it's just such an unbelievable, perhaps all too believable, but still a startling story. What happened on September 10th, 1959? Well, school buses uh, started going down Prince Edward County roads, picking up white children to take them to this private academy that my grandfather and other white leaders in town had cobbled together over the summer by borrowing basements from churches and women's clubs and even some houses so that they could 
um, teach the white children of the academy of the county while uh, the public schools were closed. Um, a few months earlier, officials had made that decision after threatening for years um, to close the public schools if they were required to desegregate. They did move forward with that decision when required by the courts to desegregate, and um, they voted not to fund the schools. So white leaders were ready to go ahead and start this private school, which my parents both entered in 1959 as well. They called themselves the defenders of state sovereignty and individual liberties. But how overt was this, was the language at the time um, in the county uh, about what the true mission of this private institution was? I don't know that it was specifically stated in the mission of the school that that this school was, you know, to get around the orders to desegregate. But it was clear, I mean, almost all the white children in the county attended this school, or those with resources at least. Um, and it was something that most white people in the community were behind. Including your papa, your your grandfather, uh, a local dentist. Is he still alive? No, he died when I was in college. Did you ever talk to him about this, uh, about his role in this? I didn't. I didn't have the awareness. I mean, I really grew up in sort of an idyllic setting, totally separate from black members of my community. You know, there, I didn't know any blacks that lived on my street. I never played with black children. Um, I didn't go to school with black kids. No, no blacks attended our church. I really had uh, very limited interaction, and I just really didn't know this whole story. And so it was not a subject that I ever, you know, raised with him, and I really didn't develop a curiosity about until much later. When did that happen? Probably the very first time I thought about it was um, when I was a freshman at Mary Washington College in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I wanted to uh, sign on to a journalism class, and I had to talk my way into the class, and the professor asked me about where I was from, and I went to tell him the story of the school closings, and I fumbled and mixed up desegregation and segregation. I realized I couldn't even tell the story. I really had no idea what had happened. Um, but I really didn't start to explore the story until many years later when I had um, been working as a journalist for years and had moved to the West Coast and started becoming a more curious person, developing an interest in people um, who were different from me. You know, as a reporter, I was really excited to write about the people that newspapers don't do as great a job writing about people of color, immigrants, um, those living in poverty, and um, doing that kind of work, I, I developed an understanding of the white privilege I had been you know, raised with and that I still had. And that's when I started developing more of a curiosity. And then when I moved to work as a reporter in San Diego, a story came out in the New York Times that was writing about this past. And it was the first time I had really seen it written in that way, where sort of a, a national focus on what had happened there. And around the same time, I met my future husband, a multiracial man of American Indian heritage. And I knew I wanted to marry him. And I knew that my history, my hometown's history would matter more in the life that we forged together. But you didn't know that it was your family's history at that point. I mean, I knew my grandfather you know, was a founder of the academy and had served on the board the whole time I was um, in school there. I didn't realize, you know, sort of the depth of that and what that meant. You know, I hadn't really grappled with, with my family's role yet. I mean, at that point, I thought of it as more as my town's history and less of my family's history. When did you realize that it really was about your family? I was in graduate school at Harvard Kennedy School in 2008 and was working on a, a project for a class um, on Prince Edward. I had kind of developed an interest and started doing some interviews, thinking that maybe I could write a book. And I was reading a book written from that era specifically focused on the Prince Edward County School closings. And I saw my grandfather's name listed as a defender of state sovereignty and individual liberties. And I had never known that. How did your family feel about you writing this book that obviously implicates them in this? My history? parents have been supportive you know, all the way, even though it wasn't always easy for them. You know, they kept my kids while I did research and invited me to come stay while I was living in Boston. Um, they were supportive, even though they didn't know what the book would say. And, and it was a struggle for them, too. They were learning things along the way. And, you know, they probably have it worse than I do now, living in Farmville still, living in Prince Edward County. But my mom, you know, recently told one of my friends about reading the book that the first time she read it, she hated it. And the second time she thought, well, it's all true. Why did she hate it? It's so close to home, you know, and there's so much loyalty to, you know, we have a really happy family, and there's so much loyalty to my grandfather. 
that it was just tough to read, you know, about this part of him. Let's go back to uh, to 1959. Prince Edward Academy opens. It's just for white kids. What do the black families in Prince Edward County do? It turned out the more interviews I did, the more I realized there were so many variations of what people did. I mean, the first thing that happened was people who had kids who were rising juniors or seniors really wanted them to be able to finish school. And so there was a focus on trying to get some of those kids enrolled in Kittrell College, which was um, just over the North Carolina border. It already had some um, high school students that they were teaching, and they took in several dozen Prince Edward students so that, that they could go ahead and finish school, get their degree, which was so important to their parents. And parents were, you know, that had the means um, were willing to, to send their kids there. They would all be together. So that was a benefit. And there were parents who immediately sent their kids to live with family members and split up their kids to send to different relatives, you know, mostly in the north, so that they could um, enroll in schools there. But then there were many, many children who did not continue in education. The churches did open some training centers, which these were not schools by any means, but for several hours a day, volunteers taught kids basic skills so they could stay engaged. There were kids who traveled across the county lines every day to go to another school or live with grandparents during the week. And there were kids who went to work in the fields with their parents, you know, often picking tobacco and and never returned to school. I mean, there's just so many different instances of how how this was dealt with, but the vast majority did not go to school during that period. You say that Blacks um, in the county today still talk about a lost generation. Um, What were your interviews with um, African Americans now whose children or who they themselves uh, went through this? What was that like? It was a wonderful experience for me. I mean, it was probably the best part of writing this book. I mean, of course, there were some people who didn't want to talk to me, but I found so many were willing to tell me their stories and were honored to be able to share the stories of what they did during uh, this period. I mean, often they hadn't shared the stories with their own siblings. You know, this was just this is just something that's not talked about. I would expect there's still a lot of anger and resentment about this. And Yeah, there is. I mean, were there ever any reparations tried that, that they tried to make for these kids, these families? I mean, various things have been done. Apologies have been issued by the County Board of Supervisors and a plaque installed. Um, the state has put up a beautiful monument on Capitol Square in Richmond. The editor of the Farmville Herald um, worked to develop a scholarship for all students who were shut out of school during this period of massive resistance. You know, I, I don't think that anything has been done to to individually reimburse them or, or pay them back in some way for, for what they've suffered. In certain ways, not that much has changed in Prince Edward County. What percent of Prince Edward uh, Academy's students are now black? Um, it's about 5%. The thing that's interesting about Prince Edward Academy, which is now called Fuqua School, is they've done a lot of work to attract black students and have tried to become a really different place than they were in the past. But I found, like, a great irony was that they're working to attract students, you know, Chinese and Japanese students from halfway around the world, when for so many years black students weren't welcome there. How much do you think the county has changed um, in terms of its current education setup? I mean, the schools are still underfunded, and um, in my opinion, many people in in the community still view the public schools as the black schools, and therefore do not support them. I mean, because of the existence of Fuqua School, white students and their families, um, a lot of their resources go to Fuqua School. So the volunteer hours, donations, engagement really stays with Fuqua School. And so the Prince Edward County Public Schools still miss out on that commitment from the community. And that's one way that I think that, that the community could really, you know, make a difference, make up for what it did in the past, is to better fund the public schools and to engage in the public schools in a way that the whole community traditionally hasn't. Your book is called Something Must Be Done about Prince Edward County. Where does that title come from? Some people have quoted U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy saying that line in a speech on March 19, 1963 in Louisville, Kentucky, where he first said, the only places on earth not to provide free public education are communist China, North Vietnam, Sarawak, Singapore, British Honduras, and Prince Edward County, Virginia. 
Well, it's it's a shocking story and obviously uh, not entirely a resolved one. Um, the book, again, is Something Must Be Done About Prince Edward County, A Family, A Virginia Town, A Civil Rights Battle by Kristen Green. Kristen, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Pamela. Greg Coles is here with Bestseller News. Hey, Greg. Hi, Pamela. What's new this week? Well, before I talk about the adult hardcover lists, I wanted to uh, jump over for a second to the children's side of things where there are three new titles on the middle grade list. All literary books. (laughs) Not quite. Um, the, The three new titles might all make you think that books are the new movies or movies are the new books. Um, These are all adaptations from movies that are out now or or about to come out. Uh, At number eight, Minions, a novelization. (laughs) Of a third in the (laughs) Despicable Me enter. Exactly. The the novelization of the sequel of a sequel. Uh, Then at number seven, Jurassic World, a junior novelization of a sequel. <laughs> of a sequel of a sequel of a sequel, right? I'm not sure. How, how many Jurassic Park? I think this is the fourth. Wow. Then uh, at number five, not a sequel, but again, a junior novelization, Inside Out. Well, at least it's a highly original adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's going on with Grown Ups? On the Grown Up side of things, uh, in hardcover fiction, there are also three new titles, none of them movie novelizations, although it may not be long before the movies come out. At number seven, Janet Ivanovich and Fief Sutton continue their Lizzie Tucker series with Wicked Charms. Then at number six, uh, Mary Higgins Clark, who's now 87 years old um, and has been on the list for, you know, 50 years or more, uh, has a new book called The Melody Lingers On, a standalone thriller. Then at number three, James Patterson and Howard Ruffin have a new book called Truth or Die. On the nonfiction side of things, there are, again, three new titles. Uh, At number 16, Jennifer Arnold and Bill Klein, who star in the TLC show The Little Couple, they are little people, have a memoir called Life is Short, No Pun Intended. Then at number 14, uh, Robert Curson, who previously hit the list with a book called Shadow Divers, has another seafaring adventure tale called Pirate Hunters about the search for Joseph Bannister's ship, a 17th century pirate ship. Uh, And then at number two, um, the former Playboy playmate Holly Madison, who also um, starred in the E! reality show The Girls Next Door, has kind of a tell-all memoir um, called Down the Rabbit Hole. All right. Thanks, Greg. I'm going to hold you here for one more minute uh, to talk about questions that we got sent to us via Twitter from readers. Um, And here's a question that's come in that you would be the right person to answer as our resident poetry editor. This question is from Eileen Pop, who tweeted to the New York Times Twitter account, are there any poetry books you could recommend? What are you reading this summer? Well, actually, I I love that question because so much poetry that gets published. And uh, just for space reasons uh, in the book review, we don't have the room to to review a lot of it. Um, and, you know, really, there's quite a lot of good poetry that comes out that, um, that we just have to skip. So um, let me talk about maybe a, a half dozen titles or so um, that are either just out or coming out soon that I've been impressed with. The poet Major Jackson has a collection called Roll Deep that Norton is bringing out in August. Uh, Then Terrence Hayes had a book come out, I think it was in April, from Penguin called How to Be Drawn. Both of those uh, poets are solidly mid-career poets. These are third or fourth or even fifth collections. Christopher Gilbert, who died in 2007 after only ever having published one book, it was back in 1983, called Across the Mutual Landscape, Um, It was an influential book. A lot of people paid attention to it. And then uh, he never did anything else for the rest of his life. Well, Grey Wolf is reissuing that book, but um, also combining it with a complete second collection that was never published in his life. Um, Instead of being called Across the Mutual Landscape, this book is uh, called Turning into Dwelling. And that book comes out from Grey Wolf next week on uh, July 7th. Ada Limon has a book coming out in September from Milkweed Press called Bright Dead Things. Um, She's often written about her emotions. Um, This book takes a a decidedly feminist swerve. Um, 
the publisher describes it as having some feminist swagger to it. And she's swerve and uh, swagger. <laughs> exactly. She's not just writing from the heart anymore. Um, she's really kind of talking about gender issues and uh, getting a little bit more political. Amy Gerstler has a new book called Scattered at Sea, which Penguin brought out in May. She's a very inventive, improvisational poet. Um, there's a lot of comedy in her poems, uh, and she just draws on a huge range of influences from pop culture to antiquity. Um, she, she's uh, uh, like Terence Hayes. I've called this kind of poet before ADD poets because um, they're kind of all over the place. Um, there's almost like a hip-hop feel to these uh, poems. Poetry for our times. And then um, finally, Danielle Chapman has a debut collection called Delinquent Palaces, which Triquarterly brought out in April. It's a little bit more serious than Amy Gersler uh, or Terrence Hayes. It's um, unabashedly spiritual. Uh, it's a real kind of questing and, and religious book. Not that Chapman herself uh, necessarily believes in God, but she's kind of in constant conversations with God. Or, you know, she desires God, but kind of doubts whether you know humans are alone in the world. These uh, poems, the craft of these poems is very strong. They've been published in the New Yorker and other places. Um, you know, they're they're lovely language, um, but very serious and and very spiritual. So those are, those are all six collections that I would recommend. All right. Well, for regular podcast listeners, you now know that. Greg Coles does not just read Mary Higgins Clark and Janet Ivanovich, but also other things. Greg, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, Pamela. Um, we are happy to take other questions. If you want to send them to our email account, books at nytimes.com, or tweet them at us at nytimesbooks, or you can tweet them directly to one of the editors here. All of our Twitter handles are on the books page at The Times, which is at nytimes.com slash books. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. Our producer is Jocelyn Gonzalez, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Pamela Paul.